I work for a company that allows me to work from home most of the time, but I'm expected to go in once every week, on either Thursday or Friday. Since it's an hour drive each way, I'm glad that it's only once per week. After work, I'd usually catch up with my coworkers, grabbing dinner or a drink. Because of that, it was nearly 11 p.m. by the time I hit the road. The highway was a narrow two-lane road. It was well lit by streetlights, but deserted, making for a lonely drive. This particular stretch of road was known for its lack of cell service, a fact that I was painfully aware of. Since I drove it often, I always made sure to have a podcast downloaded for the trip. It would be way too boring otherwise. That night, the drive was uneventful until I spotted a dark van on the shoulder not far from a lamppost. No hazard lights and no movement, just sitting there in the dark. Normally I might have driven past, but something compelled me to stop. Maybe they needed help, I thought. Since there were so few cars out there, it would be a while before they could get help, so at the very least, I wanted to stop and make sure nobody was hurt. I rolled to a stop a few car lengths back and shifted into park, then I got out and walked towards the van. It appeared empty, all the doors were shut, and there was no sign of anyone around. I took a moment to look around the area, wondering if there was anything I could do. There wasn't much I could do, since there was no cell service, so I was about to leave and maybe call the police later. But suddenly, a man emerged from the woods next to the road. He seemed ordinary enough, and explained that he had stopped for a quick bathroom break. He seemed friendly as we talked, and I told him that I had stopped to see if anybody needed help. He seemed to genuinely appreciate it. I shook the man's hand, and we were about to go our separate ways. When I looked at his arm, though, I saw a spot of what looked like blood. I didn't say anything, and I turned around and went back to my car. I sat there watching as the van drove away. I didn't drive away just yet. As I thought about it some more, there was something about that guy that bothered me. Since I was curious, I decided to take a look in the woods, hoping to find nothing and put my fears to rest. I got out of my car and took my phone to use it as a light. I hadn't ventured far maybe 50 feet in when I stumbled upon a blue tarp rolled up on the forest floor. I didn't dare touch it, let alone uncover what might be beneath, but I did take a close look. There was definitely some blood on the tarp, and it looked fresh. I turned around and ran back to the road. I almost tripped twice as I climbed back up to the highway. When I reached my car, I got in, but before I could drive away, there were red tail lights backing up towards me. It was the van. Without wasting a second, I started my engine and peeled away. The van followed for a while, but I was faster and managed to lose him. I hate speeding, but in this case, I had no choice. As soon as I was back in cell service range, I called the police. The officers seemed to take my report seriously and promised to investigate the area as soon as possible. I gave them all the details that I could remember, hoping it would be enough for them to find whatever was hidden there. I was pretty sure I remembered the right spot so it shouldn't have been a problem. Days passed, and I finally heard back from the police. They had gone to the spot I described, but found nothing. No sign of the van, the man, or the tarp. I wondered if they had gotten the wrong spot, so I asked the officer if he was sure. He went on to tell me that they sent a five-person search team to comb through the area. They spent a whole day out there searching, but found nothing. Hearing that, I knew the man had moved it. There's no way they wouldn't have found it, 50 feet in from the road. I was brought into the police station to give a full description of the man and the vehicle, then I was sent home. Over the coming days, I was expecting to hear something back from the cops, but the call never came. I couldn't help allowing myself to consider the worst case, but there were deer in the area. It's possible that he hit one on the road and decided to toss it in the woods instead of calling it in. That wouldn't explain why he chased me afterwards, though and it wouldn't explain why he was concerned enough to come back in the first place. It's not illegal to accidentally run into an animal on the road, so it doesn't make any sense. I did a search for missing people in the area, and nothing seemed to match up with the time that I saw the man, so I can't say what happened that night. As far as I know, he's still out there, so I still worry that he'll turn up sometime and run me off the road for what I saw. Last Christmas, when I was off from work, I wanted to visit one of my friends. I was living in a small town near Ottawa in Canada, and my friend was about five hours away in Quebec. For those who don't know the area well, snow can get pretty crazy. 
It was a cold winter, and the temperature was around minus 20 during the day, way colder at night. I had been on the road for two hours, and even though I was not that far from the city, it felt like the middle of nowhere. I was on a winding road through forest, and the snow was only a few centimeters deep because it had been plowed recently. There was a light dusting still falling, though. I had a small SUV-type car. It had four-wheel drive, but I rarely needed it. I was taking it slow because of the conditions, and also because it was getting dark. The road was well lit, though, so that was good. I hadn't seen another car in at least half an hour. Then I rounded a bend and came face to face with a massive pile of snow blocking the road. It looked like a snowplow had carelessly dumped its load right there, without a second thought for anyone who might need to pass. I knew that snowplows would never actually do that, though. That's just what it looked like. If you've ever seen a store parking lot after the snowplow comes through, and they pile it all up in the center, then that's what it looked like. I pulled up to the obstacle, but there was no way around it, so I just stopped. Within less than a minute, a man came out from behind the giant snow pile. He seemed to struggle to get around the big mound. He went all the way to the shoulder, but he managed it. There was definitely no room for a car, though. He walked right up to my car, and I rolled down the window a crack. He quickly explained that the snowplow had left the pile. Then he went on to tell me that it was supposed to return and clear it shortly. His appearance was disheveled, which I attributed to him being possibly stranded out there. He was about 35, which was right around my age at the time. He then shared that he and his son were stuck on the other side of the pile, desperately needing a ride into town. Since the nearest town was on my side of the pile, he asked if I would take the two of them. Without giving him much thought, I nodded, ready to offer assistance. The guy reached for my door handle, but I hadn't unlocked it yet. He paused, then looked over to me expecting me to unlock it. Just as I was about to, a thought struck me, and I asked him, don't you need to get your son? The man's face closed off. He held eye contact for what felt like an hour. Then he stuttered out some excuse that made no sense. At that moment, it dawned on me that there might not be a son after all. I thought he might have made it up to play on my emotions. If I thought that a child was in need, then maybe I would let him in without question. In hindsight, it didn't make any sense for him to leave his son alone in the car anyway. I muttered an apology and then told him I was leaving. Without waiting for his response, I quickly maneuvered my SUV, turning it around in the narrow space of the two-lane road. As I drove away, I thought about that strange encounter the whole way back. It was a long detour for me, but I was able to find another way around. I did call the police to report the blockage on the road, but I didn't bother filing a report on the man himself. He never actually did anything that I thought the police would care about. I agreed to give him a ride, so reaching for my door would not be a crime. It was more of a creepy feeling, along with a few strange details. In all my time living there, I had never seen a road blockage like that before or since, so I think it was done on purpose, probably by the man himself. When I finally reached my friend's house, I told him about my experience. He told me that he had never seen anything like that either, and we both agreed that there was no reason for a snowplow to dump in the middle of the road like that especially on a remote stretch, where there was lots of space on the side. I never heard back from the police on the blockage, but I assumed someone went out to clean it up. I still can't be sure what would have happened if I let that guy into my car. I think he would have done something, though. Maybe stolen my car. And if that happened, I might have been stranded out in the cold. I could have died, for sure. This incident happened with my younger sister, Sydney, just a few months ago. One of her friends, Leah, was celebrating her 21st birthday. She invited my sister and two other friends, Nancy and Jen, to the celebration, which was actually a girl's night out. They planned to go for a short drive, have a dinner, and end the day with a movie. They were all eager to watch one particular movie. Leah had already declared that all the expenditures were on her, because it was she who was throwing the party. She told them that she would book the movie tickets online beforehand for the 8 p.m. slot, and by 10 p.m. or so, they would be heading back home. Everything went according to plans. Four girls had an early dinner at around 7.45 and headed to the movie theater afterwards. That's when they realized that things weren't going as per the plan. Leah hadn't booked the tickets she claimed, and there weren't enough seats for the time slot they wanted. Even the next show was sold out, but the one after that had plenty of seats left. 
They debated whether they should book the slot for 10.30 or watch it the next day. They decided to book the later slot. After hanging out in the mall for a few hours, they returned to the movie theater. The theater wasn't as vacant as they anticipated. There were a few couples and a bunch of friends, but one group of people stood out. It was a group of three men, aged mid to late thirties. They were giggling, whistling, and making nasty comments throughout the movie. Nancy suspected they were stoned. Considering that they were sitting a few seats ahead of them, they didn't worry about it until about an hour later. Sydney then noticed that the seats were empty and maybe the men had left, but she soon realized that they had shifted to the back with a single row separating them. Again, they thought nothing of it. It was weird, but maybe they wanted a better view. Fifteen minutes later, Nancy, who was at the corner, noticed laughter emerging from the other side of the row, and there they were, sitting in the same row as us. Out of all places, why would they sit in the same row as ours, whispered Nancy. Leah was the most chilled out person in the group. She asked Nancy to just chill out and not ruin the movie experience. In fifteen minutes, it would be over and they could leave. A few minutes had passed, and the laughter and whispers from the men only increased. They even managed to move a few seats closer to the girls. This time it wasn't just Nancy, even the others were concerned. Even before the end credits rolled, they jumped out of their seats and marched towards the exit. As soon as they were out, they tried booking a cab. Nancy and Jen shared an apartment, and Sydney lived only a few minutes away in the same area. They planned to share a cab, and from Nancy's place, Sydney would walk back to hers. Leah stayed with her folks in the opposite direction, and Sydney, after a bit of struggle, managed to book a ride. Leah was still unable to. She couldn't find anyone to drive her, because it was way past twelve. They stood on the sidewalk waiting for a ride, and Nancy spotted the group of men again, but fortunately, they were on the opposite side of the road, walking in the opposite direction. After five minutes, their ride arrived, but Leah still couldn't book her ride. She declared that she'd call her brother to pick her up, but he wouldn't be happy because it was so late. She didn't have any other option, though. She asked the other girls to leave, but they were reluctant because it wasn't safe to wait there for even 15 minutes all alone. What if those guys come back? asked Nancy. Leah was sure they were gone, and she was adamant that she wasn't going with the others, as it would be farther away from her house. Two minutes into the discussion, they realized that they couldn't change Leah's mind. Nancy entered the car, followed by Sydney. Jen hesitated for a bit, then pulled Leah inside the car with her, despite Leah's protests. After they were inside, Jen informed the others that she saw the men again, behind them this time. They were coming from the direction of the movie theater, heading straight towards them. The girls managed to reach Nancy's apartment safely. After the hectic day, they just wanted to sleep. Sydney too wanted to get back to her place and relax a bit, but Jen convinced her to stay back so they could play some games until they felt sleepy. Sydney reluctantly agreed to it, and she was thankful she did, because ten minutes after they entered their apartment, Nancy heard loud music from outside. She hurried to the window and peered through the curtains. What she saw gave her chills, and she quickly shut the curtains. Sydney told them that she saw a car ahead of the apartment's gate. It stopped near a streetlight, and two men got out. She was sure they were the same man they saw previously. Leah wasn't convinced, so they switched off all the lights and then peeped through the curtains. At first, they just saw a deserted road, but then saw three men walking down the street. Their car was nowhere to be found. Maybe they had parked it somewhere. They were laughing and talking loudly. They were also looking around scanning the buildings. This wasn't a coincidence. They were literally stalking the girls. They may have even tailed the car, but couldn't find the exact apartment. They were all terrified, especially Nancy and Jen, who were afraid that they would somehow find their home address. Leah suggested calling the cops, but the others weren't sure they had any proof that the men had stalked them. Only a few minutes had passed when they heard sirens and saw a police patrol vehicle at a distance. This made the men panic, and they sprinted in the other direction, then sped away in their car. Police chased them, but the girls weren't sure if they were caught. It was later discovered by Jen that some neighbor had called the cops about three drunk men creating a disturbance in the area. Fortunately, they were never seen again in the neighborhood. Later that week, one of their classmates informed Sydney about three men, fitting the description of their stalkers, harassing two teenage girls near the movie theater. 
This was interrupted by some bystanders, who had then called the police. They even tried to kidnap one of the girls, but couldn't manage to leave and were caught. The girls were horrified, and it was the last time they ever went to see a late night movie. It wasn't worth the risk. Last summer, I took a job in Florida, even though I was a student in New York City for the rest of the year. I had my car down there with me, so at the end of August, I had to drive back by myself. It was a long drive, and I knew it was probably too much to do in a single day. By the time I reached North Carolina, the sun had dipped below the horizon, leaving the sky a deep shade of indigo. The remote highway I was traveling on seemed to stretch on forever. Street lights were few and far between, and the further I drove, the more isolated I felt. It was around 10 p.m. when I first saw him, a single man on the side of the road. He wasn't hitchhiking, nor did he seem to be walking with any purpose. When I saw him, he was simply standing there on the side of the road, looking round. He was a tall guy wearing all black clothes. He had a black hat and red hair spilling out from the sides. He also had a short red beard. I only got a quick look at him, so I can't say much about his age. I felt like there was something weird about that guy, but I drove past and thought that would be the end of it. After all, what could I do if there was trouble? I was alone and unarmed. I continued driving, eager to put distance between myself and that mysterious guy. However, about a half mile down the road, another person appeared. This one was standing directly in the middle of the highway, waving his hands frantically. I slammed on the brakes and came to a stop just feet away from him. The man wasted no time, rushing to my window and pleading for help. His eyes were wide with fear, and he kept glancing over his shoulder as if expecting someone or something was coming. He claimed that he was being chased, and that his car had been stolen at gunpoint. He even added that his brother was taken with the car. Despite the alarm bells ringing in my head, there was something about him that seemed genuine. One thing for sure about him was that this guy was terrified. If he was faking it, then he deserved an Oscar for sure. I know you shouldn't let strangers into your car, but I thought he was in danger and I really wanted to help. So I unlocked the door and let the man in. I didn't have service on that stretch of road, otherwise I would have called the cops right away. We drove in silence for a few minutes, and the tension in the car was heavy. Finally, I broke the silence, asking him where he needed to go. He directed me to a gas station a few miles ahead, saying it was the only place that he knew he could call for help. As we pulled into the gas station, the man jumped out of my car and rushed inside to make the call. I stayed in the vehicle. While I was waiting, I pulled out my phone and found that I had spotty coverage at best. After about five minutes, I saw the man come out of the store and started pacing back and forth near the entrance. He was shaking, and I'm pretty sure he was crying. It was then that I knew for sure that he was for real. He had every opportunity to rob me, but he didn't, and he was still distressed. I had made the right move, I knew that. The police got there soon after and talked to the man. I watched from a distance, feeling increasingly out of place. I wasn't sure what I could do to help, but I stayed just in case. When a police officer approached me from my side of the story, I told him everything I knew, including the sighting of the first man by the roadside. The man I had picked up overheard this, and then interjected. He claimed that the first man I saw was the one who robbed him at gunpoint, taking his car and leaving him stranded. There were already police cars searching the highway, but I didn't find out what happened right away. In all the commotion, I knew I couldn't drive any more that night. It was around 11 by then so I found a motel and tried to get some sleep. In the morning, I got a call from the police. They asked me to come to the station and identify a suspect. When I got there, they had him. Even though I just saw him in passing on the road, he was unmistakable. Before I left, I asked if the man's car and brother were found. I'm not sure if the police were supposed to do this, but they told me what happened the night before. The man I had picked up was indeed the victim of a robbery. He and his brother stopped to help a stranger who ended up robbing them. The car was found abandoned in a field, and most importantly, the man's brother was found walking down the side of a rural road at around midnight. He was lost and scared when they found him, but unharmed otherwise. After that, I was free to go, and I got home later that night. Although I made the right decision to stop, I know it was a risky move. There was nothing stopping that man from robbing me, or worse.
so it was really lucky that he was for real. I still don't know why the first man was standing on the side of the road, since he stole the second man's car. Judging by the fear coming from the second man, though, I think the man with the red hair was chasing him. He must have given up right around the same time when I saw him. It was an ominous and confusing night for me, and I'm glad I was able to help a person in need. My brother and I live near Birmingham, Alabama, and we were planning to visit family in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Work had been busy for both of us, and we worked together for our uncle at the time. We were both taking a week off for the trip, and it was our first vacation in a long time. We left at around 3 p.m. on a Friday, both taking off from work early, otherwise we would have been driving through the night. It would still be late when we planned to arrive, because it was a 9 or 10 hour drive. The beginning of our trip was smooth, with clear skies and open highway stretching before us. Traffic in the area is usually not too bad, so we were making good time. At first, we were talking a lot, but as time went on, our conversation dwindled and we were just listening to music. We had been on the road for hours, and the sun was going down. Around that time, the weather took a turn. Dark clouds rolled in quickly, swallowing up the last of the daylight, and then the rain started. It wasn't just a drizzle, it was a torrential downpour that made it hard to see more than a few feet in front of the car. I slowed down, gripping the wheel tighter as I navigated through the increasingly bad weather. It can be really dangerous to drive in those conditions, so I always take it slow when that happens. The rain had been coming down hard for almost half an hour when something caught my eye on the side of the highway. As we got close, I realized it was a person standing in the rain, drenched from head to toe. It looked like a woman, and as we passed, she waved at us, a clear signal that she wanted to ride. I hesitated for a moment, because it can be dangerous to pick up strangers, but leaving her out there in the middle of nowhere in the pouring rain just seemed too cruel. I pulled over in front of the woman, and she quickly made her way to the car. She opened the back door and climbed in without a word. The first thing that struck me was that she was completely soaked, but didn't seem to be shivering or cold. It was about 15 degrees out, so not dangerously cold, but with that kind of rain, most people would be shivering. I glanced at her through the rearview mirror, but her face was partially obscured by wet hair. It was a creepy sight, but I didn't worry about her at first. Derek and I felt pretty secure that if she was trouble, then we could handle it. Where are you headed? I asked, trying to sound friendly. There was no reply. She just sat there silent, staring straight ahead. I exchanged a look with Derek, who shrugged, as if to say, what can you do? I turned back to the road and continued driving, figuring she'd speak up when she was ready. But that never happened. Minutes stretched into what felt like hours, and the mood in the car became tense. I tried again, asking if she was okay. Again, no response. By then, I began to think she was on something, because her behavior was so strange. Her eyes were bloodshot, and I don't think she blinked a single time since she got into the car. Then without warning, she lunged forward between the front seats, her hands reaching for my throat. It happened so fast that I barely had time to react. I swerved, trying to fend her off with one hand while keeping the car from careening off the road with the other. Derek struggled with her, trying to pull her back. The car skidded to a stop at the side of the road, the rain still hammering down on us. Together, we managed to push her out of the car and lock the doors. We sat there panting, trying to make sense of it all. I looked in the rearview mirror. The woman was standing there behind my car, just looking at us. I shifted into gear and started driving to put some distance between us. I looked at my brother. Should we call the police? Derek asked. I nodded, already reaching for my phone. We gave them our location and explained what she had done as best we could. The operator told us that somebody would be out to check the area and find the woman. We decided not to press any charges, because we didn't want to wait around. We really just called the cops to make sure somebody would come out and check on her. Once I hung up the phone, I looked at Derek. He was cradling his right arm just out of view from me, in the driver's seat. I asked him what was wrong, and then he showed it to me. There were four bloody gashes on his arm. It looked like he had a run-in with Wolverine from X-Men. I asked what happened, and Derek told me that she scratched him. The woman must have had her nails filed into claws to do that kind of damage to my brother. I asked if he wanted to go to the hospital, but Derek said no. We pushed on with the drive, 
wanting nothing more than to get to our cousin's house. It was past midnight when we finally arrived. Our cousins could hardly believe it when we told them what happened. The next day, Derek did go to the doctor for the wounds on his arm. He didn't need stitches, but he had it wrapped in a bandage for the next two days. The police never followed up with us on what happened with the woman, but I think she was on something hard. There was something about her that wasn't quite right. Even before the attack, she was more than a little off. I guess that's what I get for trying to help someone 